week's episode of the Good Ram Show with me, Chris Goodrum. Okay, um, so this week, I kind of already decided on uh, what I was going to be doing this week a few weeks ago, and um, it purely coincidence that uh, it was um, St. Patrick's Day yesterday, and lo and behold, a sort of Irish tasting. Uh, I, I've kind of tacitly called it an Anglo-Irish tasting, because, well, I only had four Irish whiskies, and I thought, well, I need... I need something else. So, um, as you can see from the uh, the introductory picture, um, that uh, other is uh, obviously uh, an English whisky. It's from the the Cotswolds Distillery. Now, can you believe it? Three years has passed since the Cotswold Distillery uh, started uh, production of whisky in two thousand and fourteen. Well, just over three years now. And I remember you know, doing a, an episode of the show some years ago. Uh, about the, uh, the the distillery and certainly tasted their um, I can't remember if it was entirely their new make or whether it was about six months old or something like that and yeah you know, I was pretty impressed with it and um, obviously the distillery were rather impressed by what I had to say about it and so consequently uh, when I was at the uh, the World Whiskey Awards um, earlier this year uh, the, um, uh, the rather nice uh, uh, rep said um, you know we like to do your episode of the show, so I said, well, I know you have a, a whiskey out, so uh, maybe you could send me a sample, and lo and behold, a sample duly arrived. So um, I'm quite looking forward to that, because I remember having, you know, uh, a lovely character, and uh, I thought it would be, you know, it, it would drink relatively early, wouldn't need sort of like uh, vast uh, amounts of time aging, because it had a, a nice barley sweetness, a softness, um, and so, yeah, it'll be interesting to see where it's at at this present moment in time. The other two uh, Irish whiskies are interesting in in their own rights. Um, one is uh, one is a distillery, the other is a revival of an old brand. Yes, yes, I know, I know what, what you, you're thinking. Um, so we're looking at two bottlings from the Glendowler distillery. Now, um, there's very little information online of, about the distillery, it has to be said. It's all very patchy and it seems to be there's one interview with uh, one of the guys that set the distillery up and it's been recopied on countless web pages, it has to be said. But from what I can make out, the distillery itself was founded in 2011 uh, on an industrial estate in County Wicklow. Uh, I believe they've since moved to a, 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 another premise, uh, premises I should say, um, which I think was in 2013, but I'm not entirely certain about that. So if you know more about the distillery than, than I do, then um, feel free to, to let me know. Um, apparently the distillery has a Holstein still, which they, I guess, use for their vodka and their gin, and a column still. Uh, I know they produce poitine and um, gin, and they also do their own whiskey. But as they've only been going for uh, about um, uh, five years, six years now, uh, they don't appear to have their own product out on the market. I, they, they might do. They do have another bottling, uh, which I think is called a double cask or something like that, which might be their own spirit. But the two bottlings we're looking at now, the spirit has been sourced from Cooley. And, um, yes, you, I can see a number of raised eyebrows, and like I said, it, it's a bit like the, the bottlings that were done by the Celtic Whiskey uh, Shop. Uh, yes, the, the, the juice came from elsewhere, but they have basically done something slightly different, and certainly the two bottlings that I have here from Glendalo have certainly done something different with it, so I think they're going to be really, really interesting. Um, the other two bottlings are... Like I said, they're a revival of an old brand called Kinahans. Now, um, there's a little bit more information on their website about their history, and it's always tenuous, to say the least, when these brands suddenly come back after a number of years, because um, they're not going to be what they once were, obviously. Very few people were probably around in 1779 when um, the brand was first established. And does it matter? Well, for some people, yes, it does. But for other people, it doesn't really matter. And like I said, for me, it's the quality of the, of the juice, what's actually in the bottle itself. Um, and so apparently this 
Kinahan's was, uh, like I said, founded by someone called Daniel Kinahan in 1779 and pretty much stayed in the family uh, right the way through to about 1911 when um, the, the business operations were transferred to a Dublin-based wine and spirits merchant called Baggett Hutton, great name, huh? um, who uh, in about nine years later, kind of, the two companies merged and um, became um, Baggett Hutton and Kinahan. <laughs> yeah, try saying that after you've had a few. Um, the brand itself, I believe, disappeared in 1988, and as they quite nicely put it on their um, on their website in 1988, the uh, shareholders took a break. <laughs> I can't say I've ever heard of that phrase used before to dissolve a company, but there you go. And it was re-established in 2014. Again sourced from I don't know where uh, you, I think you can probably guess it's going to be one of three distilleries and um, but like I said you know it's all dependent upon uh, the quality of the whiskey in the bottle there's, there's you can you can build a backstory and yes if you're reviving an old brand then obviously you've got the history of that um, there's questionable whether what you're sort of you're just buying a brand rather than sort of being uh, associated with it you, you know I don't know who the people behind the revival of Kinahan's are maybe they have links to the original family that I honestly don't know certainly their website doesn't seem to imply that but then again you know is that a, a, a big issue um, the interesting thing I suppose about the two is like I said, these backstories, and although Glendallow doesn't really sort of have a, a history per se, they've kind of, shall we say, manufactured is not the right word, they've kind of co-opted, I guess, this whole concept of uh, some chap called um, St. Kevin. St. Kevin? I mean, d d d I don't know, I wouldn't have thought that this sort of Kevin was a, a sort of a typical Irish name uh, of the uh, of those periods, but nevertheless, apparently this is St. Kevin here on the label, who um, allegedly set up a monastery in um, Glendowler itself, God knows when, way back, and um, it's possible that he could have established a distillery there, I mean, maybe their records to say that he did maybe they they're playing a bit fast and loose with a, with a bit of history but you know they're not going to be the first people to play fast and loose with uh, with historical accuracy and um well there's it's not like they've, they've you know taken over the monastery or or have some kind of connection to it i doubt if that they had considering they set up in a uh, an industrial estate in county wicklow so um uh, a tenuous his, historical link shall we say but like I said you know some people really get into that kind of thing other people you know find it sort of a little bit um, disingenuous I guess but like I said at the end of the day all I'm really bothered about is what does the whiskey taste like so anyway I think that's enough uh, enough of the waffle and um, let's have a look at today's line -up. Right, okay, so considering the um, the, the array of different uh, styles, I've, I think I've kind of, I thought I'd just group them together. This is going to be the easiest thing. We're going to kick off with the Cotswolds bottling. Uh, so this is the Cotswolds single malt bottled at 46%, produced from Odyssey Barley. And uh, like I said, it's three years old, so uh, legal, as they say. And uh, it has been aged in a combination of Firstville, Kentucky Bourbon, uh, 220 litre barrels and 225 litre retoasted and charred X red wine casks. Now, I'm always a little bit dubious about the whole recharring and retoasting because I've often found that uh, that process can make the tannins a little bit bitter uh, and sometimes give the oak a little bit of a forced character. Um, but that's not always the case, um, but I think it'll be interesting to see, like I said, um, I was you know, very impressed with the, uh, the original um, spirit, so hopefully that will still be the case. Then we're going to look at the two Kinahan's bottlings, the first being the Kinahan's small batch, which I'm guessing is a, is a blend. Um, again, 
there's a, there's a bit of a vagary with regards to the information on it. Um, it doesn't seem to imply that it's a, uh, a blended malt or a, a, straight, a blend. So hopefully when we, uh, when we taste it, we'll discover that it's bottled at 46%. Then we're going to look at the Kinnahan's 10 year old, which is a single malt, uh, again bottled at 46%. Um, one interesting thing that I haven't mentioned is the, the label. The label hold, has um, a double L on, on it and uh, apparently this is uh, uh, due to the fact that um, the uh, Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, uh, some Charles Lennox, which I think was back in about 1800s, favoured the particular brand and uh, had his own casks uh, stamped with the, the double L, which I assume stands for Lord Lieutenant. I guess, but <laughs> I don't think it's a, a, a wild stab in the dark, shall we say. Um, so, yeah, I, again, another interesting aside may be and then I'm going to look at the two of the Glendale bottoms. The first one we're looking at is called the Black Pits 7 year old single malt. Uh, it has been um, bottled at 46%. The original uh, whiskey itself came from the Cooley Distillery, um, like a lot of them. Aged for seven years, seven years in ex American oak cask. And then they decided to finish it in um, ex Black Pits Porter casks. Uh, for around about a year so obviously not quite a full year otherwise it would have been an eight-year-old but there's all this business about seven being synonymous with Saint Kevin and etc etc and you know if you want to find out more about that like I said there's this particular article that seems to have been copied by copious websites so you shouldn't have any difficulty finding it and the second bottling which I think is probably going to be the most interesting well I don't know you know uh, um, it's as far as I'm aware it's the only Irish whiskey that's finished in um, ex Mizunara casks which as you probably well know Mizunara is Japanese oak and I can imagine they cost a fair few pennies um, so basically again it's the same same single malt it's coolie it's been aged for about 13 years in American oak casks and finished for about a year in these Mizunara punchins so should be really interesting I always like uh, to taste whiskey that has been aged in casks other than uh, American or European oak so uh, I think it should hopefully be quite a quite interesting uh, uh, episode of the show well I think so anyway so let's make a start with the Cotswolds right, okay so let's see what the nose gives us on this then shall we Now the wine is quite evident to kick off with. I mean, it's not, it's not unbalanced. Actually, it's quite pleasantly balanced, and um, there's a, a sort of a, a spicy red fruit kind of note. Um, but there's also some lovely soft barley. There's an almost kind of estery sort of pineapple banana kind of note, um, which actually kind of ties in well, I suppose, with Irish whiskey because I often get that kind of estery, banana-y kind of character in Irish whiskey, so it kind of works well in with today's tasting, I think. It's got a lovely softness, it's it's classy, it's elegant, um, it's not particularly expensive, I think you can find it on um, a few websites. Um, yeah, and I think for a three-year-old, this is this is you know, a lovely mole, um, and... Um, it just again goes to show that sort of at the end of the day, age is just purely a number. Um, you bottle your whiskey when when it's it's ready to be bottled. I mean, it's not a huge amount of oak character. It has to be said. Um, it's it, there, there is some obviously it's sitting in the background and um, or American oak character, I should say. It's um, there's a there's a little bit of vanilla, a little bit of creaminess, um, and um, yeah, I think this is really quite quite delightful. So let's see what uh, what the palate does. Mm. That's a lovely aftertaste. The sweet red fruits kind of come through on the aftertaste. It does bitter slightly on the mid palate, but that bittering brings a little bit of spice with it as well. Um, but I think it's got enough kind of barley and honey and, and malt notes 
to kind of sort of stand up to it. And it's not a kind of like mouth puckering bitterness, should we say. It's just a subtle bitterness. And personally, I think it kind of all adds into the character. It's a lovely, soft, again, slightly estery uh, malt with a bit of barley and a bit of honey and like I said it has that really lovely aftertaste as the as the sort of the winey red fruits going to come through on, on the finish um, so yes it's got lovely progression uh, I think this is going to develop sort of like quite uh, quite quite nice but I think at the moment it's 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 a very pleasant whiskey so yeah nice start right there. Okay, so let's move on to the first of the two Kinahans. This is the small batch. Let's see what the nose goes. Now, I, I would. There is what feels to me some, some grain influence here, so I'm going to sort of guess that this is a blend, a proper blend rather than a blended malt. Um, there's a sort of an almost saline kind of grainy note to it, but underneath it, there's some lovely malt again. A slightly estery, sort of bananary, pineapple kind of note. Touch of oak, just a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is retailing for mid thirties. I think, which is a, about right. I think um, it's certainly got a little bit of a little bit of coffee, a little bit of spice coming through now. It's all very harmonious and 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 very pleasant. I think. Let's see what the palace like. Quite generously malty, full, again, apricot, honey, barley to start off with. The grain notes start to come through on the middle and kind of outlast the malt, should we say, but I often find that is the case with with blends that um, the grain does start to sort of like you know roll in and then sort of take over towards the end. It's not harsh. It's got a lovely softness. There's a sort of an edge to the grain. Um, like I said, gives it an almost kind of saline like kind of character. A little bit of soft oak. Yeah, it's all very harmonious, very drinkable. Um, it's not the most complex whiskey I've ever tasted in my entire life, but I think. Uh, I think the juice is pretty good actually, so yeah, another one. Okay, so let's move on to the 10 year old. Let's see what the nose gives us on this end, shall we? Quite fresh, um, malty. Again, there's that sort of estery fruit character coming through. There's a, a little bit of kind of baked fruit in the background, which kind of gives an indication that it's got a little bit of age under its belt. There's a touch of oak. It's all very mellow, it's easy going, it's, it's, it's pleasant. Um, I like it. it. I think it's a little bit expensive for what it actually is, personally speaking. Um, I forget what, I'm having, what, what, what it would have to be retailed for, but I think it's somewhere in the region of 60 quid, which for a 10 year old is a um, a little bit much, uh, it has to be said, but it's got a slight perfume note kind of coming through. The barley is becoming slightly perfumed. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 nice, it's pleasant, it's well put together. It's a, it's it's good. Let's see what the palace like. Oh, that's a juicy palate. Mmm, lots of honey on the middle. Kind of kicks off with a bit more of the oak in actual fact. The oak is very kind of creamy, almost like clotted cream, um, with apricot and, and banana and a little bit of apple. It's kind of oh, really quite pleasant. You know, there's a little bit of spice, a little bit of bitter spice. Um, like I said, really juicy. Which spices really tingle on the tongue. It's yeah, it's really very very good quality. I mean, they have obviously sourced their malt well for this particular bottling. Like I said, possibly a little bit expensive for what it actually is, but yeah, I think 
by and large, I'm quite, quite impressed with that, that's nice. Right, okay, so let's move on to the first of the two Glendower bottlings. This is the um, seven-year-old Black Pit. Let's see what the nose gives us. Oh, well, that's unusual. Uh, um, really herbally. Um, there's a sort of almost botanical note to the to the herbal herbal character. It's sort of a touch of juniper, possibly, but um, maybe some thyme, possibly heather. Which it's got a, a very obvious um, sort of stouty, sort of chocolatey kind of uh, character, and um, I'm guessing that. He probably wouldn't have wanted to finish it for much longer than than a year in those casks because the the, the stout notes are quite quite up there and in your face, so to speak. Um, there's some maltiness to it. There's some spirit character. Um, in actual fact, it kind of there's a a bit of a hardness to the to to, to the, the the whiskey. Kind of less coolly should we say and it kind of reminds me a little bit more of the sort of the, the sort of the hardness of, of bush mills and um although as we know this is definitely from coolie and that's why i kind of think that the kinahans uh has been sourced from coolie because it has that lovely sort of and i know it's a bit it's being generalistic but generally speaking from my experience coolie tends to be quite round quite soft in character um whereas bush mills has that sort of slightly edge edge to it um, but apparently, according to the distributor, uh, it's not from Cooley, it's from one of the other two. So I can't believe it's going to be from Middleton, because I think Middleton does probably more pot still than anything else. Um, so it would have to be from Bushmills, but anyway. It's, um, like I said, the, the, where it actually comes from to this is, is fairly irrelevant. It's kind of what you don't do with it afterwards. And um, this is really unusual. And I think it's going to be, it's a sort of, I wouldn't quite go as far as saying a Marmite whiskey, but certainly you've got to like these kind of intriguing whiskies. Um, and uh, this has certainly got an intriguing nose. But it's quite, but it's balanced. It's not all too weird and wacky. There is definitely some, some lovely sort of grounding to the malt um, to allow that sort of uh, herbal kind of character to sort of, you know, rise above it, shall we say. So anyway, let's, let's see what the power gives us. Chewy, malty, intriguing. Um, it kind of kicks off again with a lot of the sort of chocolatey, stouty kind of notes. Certainly very herbal, like the nose would suggest. Um, again, sort of like a, a little bit of juniper thyme. Maybe some mint, possible. Um, certainly has a nice freshness to it. Um, it's got a depth to it. It's got some lovely maltiness. And like I said, it's just the right side for me of kind of overtly weird and wonderful. Um, I mean, this is completely different to say, for example, the um, the, the Jameson Castmates, uh, which I reviewed ooh, some time ago now. Um, that stout kind of just gave it a nice kind of rounded chocolatey sort of softness. This has certainly got a herbal edge to it. It's completely different in character and and yeah, really quite unique, I think. Okay, and finally we're on to the Mizunara finish. Uh, let's uh, see what that gives us on this end, shall we? Straight off the bat, it has that Mizunara kind of character, that sappiness that I often find with whiskey that's been aged in that type of cask. Again, there's a little bit of herbal notes. Um, obviously, nowhere near as herbal as the um, uh, the, uh, the stout finish. A lovely softness and a sweet barley note. Um, apricot, touch of apple, a little bit of spice, but that sort of sappy oak note, although not being dominant, is just you're continually aware of it, if that kind of makes sense. Um, I mean, the thing with 
sort of try to when you nose whiskey is it's kind of trying to you know you sort of put your nose in you sort of pick up the initial obvious notes and then you try and ignore them and in this instance it's quite difficult to ignore that Mizunara character but it's got a lovely maltiness beneath it I mean I think this is absolutely gorgeous um, it doesn't feel like a 13 year old it certainly feels quite younger although there is a, a little bit of a sort of baked fruit kind of note just at the edges which seems to would imply a little bit of age um, yeah that is that's a lovely nose let's see what the power gives us wonderfully soft, rounded, malty, more American oak character on the palate, um, which I suppose you would expect, but then like I said, the Mizunara is a very noticeable style of oak, and it does give that kind of sappy woodiness right on the edges, again, almost starting to move into a sort of like a herbally kind of character, um, but the it's right at the edge. Uh, it's certainly not quite as, as, as dominant as the nose would kind of suggest. Lovely crisp finish, sort of all white fruits, almost kind of um, mineral finish. Um, just kind of starting to move into a, into a sort of saltiness. It's, I think it's got a lovely complexity. Again, it certainly doesn't feel 13 on the palate. It's... Um, got that lovely kind of, I wouldn't quite go as far as saying youthful, but it has that lovely kind of fresh character. And um, yeah, I think all round that's, that's really nicely balanced. And yes, it's not cheap, but then I'm guessing that Mizunara casks, A, are not going to be cheap, and then B, you've got to get them from, um, from Japan. So, um, you know, chuck on the, the shipping costs on top of the, the purchase price, and they're probably going to be a fair few quid shall we say so but i think it's really intriguing really nice so yep great whiskey okay so let's sum today's episode of the show up um well i think it's been a really intriguing tasting um i mean i know there's a lot of you guys that uh, watch in the states and in europe and um, probably most of these whiskies are not going to be available over there but you know you can purchase them and we'll ship them out and that kind of thing um or somebody will should we say uh, anyway so the cotswold single malt yeah i i like that i think it showed amazing promise uh, a few years ago um when i when i last tasted it and um i think uh, it's it's a, a lovely soft whiskey the the use like i said i was a bit skeptical to start off with with the whole sort of recharge uh, wine cask business but I think it's worked pretty well in actual fact that the bitterness is, is controlled and, and adds to uh, the overall complexity of the whiskey I think and it's I think it's just going to be really interesting to track that evolution. Uh, the Kinahan small batch yeah pleasant you know uh, not like I said not the most complex of, uh, of, of blends that I've ever tasted but you know it's it's perfectly acceptable it's a pleasant whiskey it's an easy going whiskey it's probably what you might term a session whiskey i suppose so um yeah got no problem with that whatsoever the 10 year old again you know pleasant uh certainly sort of like you know very palatable you know pleasant maybe a little bit expensive for what it actually is but you know um i'm certainly not going to knock the quality of uh, of the actual spirit i think that's uh, that's pretty good and uh, the the um the seven year old the black the black pits i, I like that I, i'm really quite enamored by it i like a little bit of weird and wonderful in my whiskey and i don't think it's it's too weird and wonderful should we say uh that uh, it's it's not enjoyable it's not like um say the corsair for example which was a very very acquired taste of memory serves me correct the sort of the stuff that they were doing was kind of really experimental and uh, when you're sort of really doing some experimental stuff it can either work or it can fail horribly and uh, i think they were this is certainly not not in that kind of um area shall we say it's it's certainly 
just the right side of weird and wonderful and uh, yeah I, I really really like that um, and finally the Mizunara finish well you know again really impressed with that particular whiskey I mean again not particularly cheap um, but I think it's certainly worth it and you know I I love Mizunara oak and uh, you just just don't see very much of it and, uh, and to find a sort of like a, an Irish whiskey that's been finished in Mizunara is, uh, is is unusual to say the least and and I think that's kind of like the, the thing uh, with Glendower they certainly sort of have an idea of what they want to produce yes all right they're initially like a lot of uh, startup distilleries sourcing their malt from elsewhere but to me not an issue got no problem with that whatsoever because it's what you do with it and certainly they've done some interesting stuff with that particular whiskey so uh, um, well if there's anybody watching from the distillery then you know uh, I'd love to taste your own particular malt so if, you know if you want to send me some samples then then that would be absolutely fantastic but anyway as for today's episode of the show that's pretty much about it in the bag as they say so uh, I hope you've enjoyed it and all I have to say is good afternoon and good morning. Oh, and happy St. Patrick's Day, by the way, for those of you watching in Ireland. Mm -hmm.